a video on the next uh, on the next slide. Yes, Doctor yes. Leono. Okay. Now we are going to ask ourselves a few questions. And the number one is why do some people get addicted and others don't? It's very critical to understand why some people get addicted. Don't get addicted, even though, even though they share almost the same gene profile and uh, almost the same environmental situation. Then we, we are also going to ask ourselves whether addiction is a genetic disorder. And if so, so what? We also need to ask ourselves whether addiction is purely environmental disorder. And uh, I'm going to discuss about uh, this concept of a little addict and a fake addict. Next slide, please. Are we there? Are we there? Yes, doctor. Okay, you know, when I go to an, another slide, I, I need to confirmation that we are, we are on the same page. Apologies, okay. I will be. Okay, so, so it, it, uh, we asked ourselves if addiction is a genetic disorder. And uh, I'm confirming to you that addiction is a genetic disorder. Actually, all diseases are genetic disorder when looked from a very um, minimalistic kind of perspective. Even in infections are genetic disorders. EB is a genetic disorder. And I'm going to explain why. This is because um, the way you, you, when you get infected, for example, um, all of us are exposed to the bug, to the bug. but um, and all of us, when we get a, 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 a vaccination, we react differently because of our genetic constitution. There are some people, even though they are they have the obesity, they still get to be, uh, even though their immunity is still not compromised. It is because the genetic constitution of people varies from person to person. And that genetic constitution confers to you the ability to uh, fight infectious diseases. Uh, there are some of us who can fight almost anything. There are others who uh, are weak. So I'm confirming that uh, addiction is a genetic disorder, but uh, with a caveat. As with all other genetic disorders, <sighs> it is not that without the genes being acted upon by environmental pressures, the disorder shall never be manifested. And this is demonstrated by the fact that uh, uh, if you have two males in the same family, they have been exposed to the, uh, two male offspring in a family that uh, has got a heavy genetic loading. Uh, one, one male gets addicted, the other one doesn't get addicted because uh, even if they're coming from the same parents, they, their genetic constitution is still different. Uh, okay. But uh, the important thing to note here is that uh, if you are coming from a, a, a family with heavy genetic loading and you are never exposed to alcohol, you will never become an alcoholic. Therefore, environmental pressures are very important in the manifestation of genetic diseases. So, uh, and uh, the, this is what I'm saying in the second bullet. Uh, no, 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 it's not. So, um, uh -uh, okay, never get exposed to uh, you'll never be addicted to that. So, the next bullet is saying uh, a person who has never been exposed, if a person has got a heavy loading of, uh, of alcoholism and he doesn't get exposed to alcohol, he'll it doesn't mean that you not develop other disorders because there is a reason why people become alcoholic, which I'm going to get into uh, later in the slide. So in the second bullet, I'm saying if, a person, if, if such a person is not exposed to the alcohol, he'll develop some other disorders because I'm, I'm proposing that uh, um, addiction 
uh, can be viewed as an inability to generate internal happiness because uh, people who get addicted, what they are actually looking for is happiness from external sources because they are unable to generate internal happiness. And uh, so if, if a person is uh, um, predisposed to getting uh, genetic, uh, I mean, alcoholism, for example, uh, and he doesn't get exposed to, he doesn't get addicted. I, I, I mean, he doesn't get exposed to alcohol. He is going to develop other disorders consistently in the in, in internal state of inability to generate happiness. And such disorders that can be uh, examples of such disorders are depression, anxiety, obesity, hypertension, pain, diseases. Addiction to other substances, uh, such as fat, bank, pethidin, cocaine, heroin, amphetamine, sex, or pornography. And uh, this breath is talking about uh, alcohol. If you're not exposed to alcohol, the alcohol is not the only substance that you can use to generate, uh, to get the happiness from external sources. There are, there are those other things that are talked about. Uh, okay, the next slide. Yes, we are both. Okay. So let's look at the brain and addiction. So um, the function of the brain is only one. And that is to make one behave in a manner that always enhances his or her survival. And in this respect, the, the brain puts objects consumed by the body as either beneficial, that is uh, food, oxygen, water, security, and sex. All non-beneficial. In the brain, there are no two, uh, it is not, there are no three things about things that are beneficial. It is either the, uh, the thing that you consume is beneficial or And the brain's hierarchy of need on objects consumed by the body for a normal person starts with the oxygen. You must breathe first for you to be alive. Then uh, you must eat for you to be alive. Then uh, you must drink water for you to be alive. And then you must be secure. And the last one is sex. So this thing, oxygen is number one, food is number two, water number three security number four, and sex number five. And the brain's hierarchy, uh, that's for a normal person. But the brain's hierarchy of needs on the objects consumed by, by the body who are really, really addicted. And uh, please underline the word really because uh, I'm going to uh, come back to a uh, tweet later. For a really addicted person, is oxygen, but number two is not food. It is psychoactive substances. Sorry, Doctor. Yeah. Uh, you are breaking. Am I breaking? Hello. 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 Yes, Doc. Uh, you are. Uh, there are some moments we we are missing uh, some words. Okay, like we need to write. I can repeat. Kindly, just uh, you can probably just start and then we catch up. In, on, which, on, uh, on, on which bullet? Number three or number one? Or number, uh, number, number two, uh, the brain hierarchy. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm saying the brain hierarchy of needs on the objects consumed by the body for a normal person. Is number one oxygen, number two food, number three water, number four security, number five sex. On the other hand, the brain's hierarchy of needs on the objects consumed by the body who are really, really addicted person is number one oxygen, number two psychoactive substances. Number three, food. Number four, water. 
Number five, security. And number six, sex. So this person has got six. Uh, the, the addicted person has got six issues. But the normal pa the person who is not addicted has got five issues because uh, it's not, number two position has been occupied by this uh, foreign called psychotic substances or other objects of addiction. Are we clear? Hello. 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 Yes, Doctor. It's clear. Okay? Yeah. No. Next slide. Are you there? Are you there? Yes, yes Doctor. You're on the next slide. Okay. In the last slide, I talked about a real addict and a fake addict. And uh, this is the concept that the brain of real addicts predisposed. We are talking about the brain of a person who is predisposed to be developing an addiction. The way the, the, his brain codes um, objects they get addicted to is beneficial to their survival during the, their first encounter. So this, if a person is predisposed to getting addicted, he, he'll code. Uh, some substances from external sources as, as uh, beneficial to their survival. And I've talked about in the other slide about the psychoactive substances. And as the person continues getting exposed to these substances or uh, continues growing in this addiction career, this coding gets stronger and, and strong until it overtakes others as number two, just like I was talking about above there. And this is just a house in there. That statement is not complete. So uh, just in the first bullet, uh, it's just after oxygen. Now, the brain of fake addicts not the dispute to developing addiction, who the objects they get quickly addicted to is not beneficial to their survival during their first encounter. What I'm trying to say, because this might look a bit um, cryptic, this sentence is, is, is talking about if you are not predisposed to getting addicted to a substance on your first encounter with it, you, um, it is not going to be quoted as important to your survival. And I've just lost my slides. Are you together? Yes, we are. I have just, my computer has just lost my True, yes, sir. we were in second Sorry. bullet. I was trying to explain yes, about fake and real addict. So, uh, the brain of fake addicts not a predisposed to developing addiction will put the object to get exposed quickly as not beneficial to their survival during their first encounter. And as they continue uh, using these substances, this, this coding gets stronger, but it never overtakes others as number two, just after oxygen. It is the same statement, but with some changes, because uh, uh, we, are, we are going to understand later how uh, a person might uh, just clinically behave like uh, he's addicted, but he's, uh, he's a fake addict. And uh, it's very difficult to differentiate a fake addict and a, and a, and a real addict before the substances are with the bloom. Next slide, please.
Are you there? Yes, Dr. Ribe, there. Okay. Bullet one. And now we are talking about Lil and fake addicts. A little addict is the one who relaxes despite getting the best treatment. So this person will go to all manner of rehabilitation centers, will get all manner of the best treatment, but he kind of doesn't. He always relaxes. Because there is something that uh, has not been sorted out. Number two, we remember number two is just a flower skin. And uh, if you imagine, uh, withdrawing oxygen from from yourself, you start behaving in a in a in a, in a manner that you must get oxygen and then you are going to die. And this is uh, kind of what these guys behave like. A fake addict is the one who recovers despite getting little or no treatment. This is a person who who, who, who looks like addicted. So he goes to hospital because of a fracture or a road traffic accident. He stays in the in in in, in the ward for a, uh, one week or two, and uh, out of the bruise, he, he becomes the a heel. Or the or, or the person is taken to a rehab. He spends the time in the rehab, and uh, after that, he's just it is because he didn't didn't need that substance. He had just uh, developed the behavior of using the substance, but it was not occupying position. So the difference between the two is only known after attempts at treatment because the two satisfy all the clinical requirements for a diagnosis of addiction. A holiday, a holiday to that part. So then the little addict does not recover because it's number two in the brain has not been. Remember, number two is just next to oxygen. And now, this number two is the same as um, has got something to do with a person's ability to generate internal happiness. In other words, because you have said that the people uh, 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 engage in addictive behaviors in order to, to become happy, if they are not happy, they are going to revert to their original behavior or, or their previous behaviors in, in order to generate happiness. Because happiness in a person's life is very critical. And it's actually the reason why we are on this planet. If, uh, if it was just about being unhappy, I, I think this, this uh, life would be very, very uh, boring. So we need from time to time to get ourselves happy and you know we, um, when you are given a holiday, you are given an annual leave you want to go somewhere and relax, you know, be happy. Next slide, please. And uh, are we there? Yes. Okay. So, we are still on the little and fake addicts. The number two is not, is not okay. is just the, the position number two in, a, in, a, in an addict is occupied by um, something, something, but and this something is just next to oxygen. And if this something is not sorted, the person shall use the substance to fill the number two void. Because if there is no, uh, and if I might use this uh, example uh, uh, in terms of uh, cocaine addiction, you have seen the way a cocaine addict um, uh, will do anything so that he can get his, 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 uh, his dose. I don't know whether you guys have seen this. And uh, he can even steal, he can even do very dangerous things because he's number two. There is a void just next to him. And you can imagine how people feel when they are, they are deprived of oxygen. It is the same kind of feeling that these guys, uh, the, 
the, it's the same guy kind of thing that this person who who's the, who's number two has been withdrawn uh, is going to uh, behave. And number two void is filled by training. Oh, okay, and uh, the person shall uh, you uh, shall, shall use the substance to fill the void. The number two void, even though he had uh, okay promised people that he uh, he has recovered. And number two void is filled by training. Uh, uh, here we are saying that uh, in bullet number two, the only way to fill this void in the absence of a of um, the, 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 the substance you are addicted to is to train the person to generate internal happiness. Once the person is able to generate internal happiness, then uh, uh, you can be sure that uh, there'll be no much need for that substance. And next slide, please. Are we there? The next slide. Yeah, we are on the next slide. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about uh, what uh, addiction is in the familiar sense. An addiction is a behavioral repertoire that is characterized by prioritization of substance use or other behavior at the expense of activities that enhance one's survival, as evidenced by one of the following, that is craving craving for the, uh, engaging in the behavior, add to use or en engage in the behavior, tolerance, and you uh, the person finds himself using the substance despite negative consequences occasioned by the use of the substances that he's aware of. Like he can have an, an accident when he was uh, uh, intoxicated, but after getting treatment, that will not de deter him from getting intoxicated again, even though he knows it is driving himself home or whenever he's driving himself. And the other one is the, yeah, the person finds himself taking more of the substance that he's uh, Next slide. Next slide, please. You're there? Yes, Doc, we're on the next slide. We are still uh, extra, uh, explaining about addiction, uh, what the addiction is. And the person will use the sub excess of the substance in particularly hazardous situations, like driving under the influence of alcohol, coming to work uh, intoxicated, though he knows he can uh, um, get uh, into contact with coronavirus patients or other. Uh, all other highly infectious patients. Uh, and uh, the person will use the substance to get a fix. You know, there are people who, who, who use the substance to, to, be, to socialize, but there are people who use the substance to get high. The other thing that is not there is uh, uh, experiencing a, a blackout. Uh, particularly when you're talking about alcohol addiction. Please remember, uh, you can add that for yourself, blackout. And a blackout is the situation in which the person's frontal lobes are actually uh, anesthetized. So he's just using the brainstem. And, uh, and uh, the characteristics of a, uh, of, of a blackout are that uh, the person uh, does very complex uh, 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 motor activities, but uh, uh, after sleeping, he has no recollection of what happened. For example, you have had people say, say that uh, you have had a colleague say that the car knows my home. That is what they are talking about. They know they are going to a, a live home, however drunk they are, because uh, they, uh, at that time they are on autopilot. They are prone to look they're not. Function. Next slide. We are on the next slide. Okay. So, what is, is addiction a disease? 
And uh, the World Health Organization recognized addiction as a disease in 2004. Although in the uh, standard definition of a disease, it does not fit into the germ theory of disease. Just like most other non-communicable diseases, the germ theory of disease uh, postulates that uh, for something to be good, for, 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 for you to define a disease, you must add it. Uh, define the germ that is causing that disease. And in this context, you know, malaria causes, uh, I mean, uh, uh, um, plasmodium causes malaria. So we have a perfect uh, fit into this theory. Uh, TB, tuberculosis bacillus causes TB. Very fitting, very well. But in most non-communicable diseases, you are not able to identify any job that causes this condition. So just like other non-communicable diseases, including uh, diabetes, hypertension, and uh, WHO recognized the uh, addiction as such in 2004. And this classification by the WHO of ad ad um, addiction as a disease led to advocacy so that institutions could treat their employees with this knowledge in mind while dealing with, if they were dealing with people afflicted by addiction. And in this regard, the, the, the Kenyatta National Hospital has an alcohol and drug abuse policy in place. And the context of this ought to be the knowledge of all employees. I don't know whether uh, people are aware about this. But uh, if they are not aware, they are going to place the mark um, uh, maybe later in the presentation. Next slide. We are there? We are. Uh, yes. Okay. But uh, you see, we have uh, the, the most institutions have uh, had, uh, policies in place uh, that address. The way to deal with the people with addiction, but um, this being a new concept, uh, a relatively new concept, uh, controversy still uh, hid us full implementation. This is because while the hospital has a job to do, and that job is done by its human resource, that must therefore be sober, given their number calling. What is the hospital to do with those unable to perform due to their affliction? This slide is about question. So uh, these are the issues that the hospital is grappling, grappling with. And uh, the other issue is uh, the bullet number two is about the affected person. So is uh, in the in the in the in the in the terms and conditions in the policy itself. There is this requirement that uh, if you are repeatedly uh, being uh, uh, not uh, being helped and you are not recovering, then there is the option of sacking or retaliating you on medical grounds. But uh, the question that the, the victim will ask himself is that is that justifiable? Because uh, uh, if this is an if, if this is a disease just like any other non-communicable disease, then why aren't people with asthma, for example, suck if they get admitted uh, in hospital? Instead? And then uh, the other thing we have to ask ourselves: What is the role of the addict uh, of the afflicted in changing their behavior? Do they have any role? Can they continue with their addictive behavior forever? And what, what is the role of the uh, employer in terms of um, changing the behavior of the employees? Can the employee continue to uh, stand uh, non-performance forever just because uh, it is a disease? And uh, there are these issues that are being asked in the trying to deal with them. Next slide. Are you there? We are there. 
We have please proceed. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk this about statements of addiction. And in, uh, there are two types of, uh, I, mean, I mean, there are two concurrent uh, consecutive uh, treatment uh, steps that uh, I'll, I'll apply it with addiction, and that the number one is chemical detoxification. And this is the very first uh, thing that, uh, this is the very first uh, treatment that is uh, um, given to a person with addiction. And what is chemical detoxification? You realize uh, I'm not using any technical term because I don't want to confuse anyone. So I'm used, I'm, I'm trying to simplify this as much as I can. And the chemical detoxification is a process of converting a body from, from one that feels sick without the substance or without the addictive behavior here uh, uh, of the substance, you can also put in uh, 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 as well addictive behavior to, the, to, to, to one that feels okay without the substance or that addictive behavior. So, and chemical detoxification is also called substance replacement therapy. When, uh, when somebody, a body is being converted uh, or a body is being conditioned to, to not feel unwell in the absence of a substance, we use the substances that are just like uh, the substance that the person was addicted to so that we can uh, do it medically. And then we do the, the, the substance slowly until the and until the until the person's body can do without the substance, and this uh, process occurs in an in an inpatient setup. And the next uh, step uh, that is undertaken is psychosocial detoxification. And uh, this is a process of converting a body from one that feels sick without the addictive object to one that feels okay without that addictive object. There are so many steps in this psychosocial detoxification, which include uh, intrapersonal therapy, interpersonal therapy, um, family therapy, parental therapy, um, all kinds of therapies are included under this uh, psychosocial detoxification. And psychosocial detoxification must be done in a, in a, a residential facility. I've had uh, most people talking about a patient um, side of uh, psychosocial detoxification. And really, that one doesn't work. It works only for the fake addicts. If the person is really a real addict, it will not work because the first thing that you must do in, uh, in, in, uh, in treating this person is to remove him from the subject, uh, from, from the sub, uh, uh, from the object of his addiction. And you cannot do this when the person is still logically not allowed to speak. Next slide. Are we there? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, and for, for an effective psychosocial detoxification, the facility must administer what is called transformative therapy. And the aim of transformative therapy is to empower the person with the skill that enable him to generate internal happiness. Because internal happiness is the problem with the, the, the people with real addiction. Next slide. Are you there? Yes. And this is a summary of what I've been saying. Addiction equals happiness deficiency syndrome. Next slide. Are we there? Yeah, we are there. So has it been so Are there any questions? But I can, uh, I can answer this question because it's my question. Uh, people are, always ask me whether they can use 
PS, PS is responsible. And uh, the answer is yes and no. If you have had any, if a person has ever had any, um, any problem with psychosis, like if you have had a, an, an accident while intoxicated, if uh, you have had a divorce because of uh, uh, use of psychoactive substance, if you have uh, had uh, any, uh, anything that you can relate to psychoactive substances, then it, you cannot use psychoactive substances responsibly. There are people who can use psychoactive substances responsibly, and those ones are following the class of those who are not predisposed to those who the substance does not occupy position number two. And the way you know about position number two is about uh, uh, whether you are doing, uh, whether you satisfy the clinical criteria for being an addict, which we have discussed above. If you, plus, uh, if, if you satisfy that criteria, you cannot use the substance responsibly. If you don't qualify, if you don't, um, if you do not uh, satisfy that criteria, you can uh, you, you can teach yourself that you are going to use the substance uh, responsibly, but uh, the more you use the substance, the more you grow in your career for using the substance, and the more you are likely to uh, graduate into an addict. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much for that enticing uh, discussion. I personally have so many questions. Uh, you spoke about um, a real addict and a fake addict. And uh, you've also mentioned that uh, addiction is a genetic disorder. And like all genetic disorders, you have to have a trigger. So my, my, my first question is this fake addict. I, it, do, we, do we do studies? Uh, are there studies that have been done to see the real addicts uh, like a genetic mapping or genetic tests to see if they're actually addicts? Unfortunately, this is a very new concept. Oh, okay. So, uh, okay, My, uh, can I respond? Yes, kindly. Yeah, um, the fake versus the real addict It's not a widely known concept. So uh, the research is not there, even in publications. But um, what this is uh, experiential. This, at, the, at this level of this knowledge, this is experiential. Um, no, studies have not been done, but uh, um, people are trying to think in that direction. and. Uh, the more people think in that direction, the more um, the, it, it will spark them to do the studies. Thank you. Uh, on another note, is um, is um, it's just a a quick question uh, for the number two, the replacement. So you get a lot of people who are probably addicted to food, uh, addicted to pornography, addicted to the different hierarchies of needs in, in, um, in our day-to-day -day lives. So as a psychiatrist, do you see the other types of addiction as common, especially in the African setting? Over to you. Can I speak now? Yes. Oh, okay. The most common type of addiction is to the substances. Because uh, you see the substances, um, uh, the, the, and, and the most common type of substance addiction is the one that is very common, and the one that is legal. So uh, number one is alcohol, is, because alcohol is legal, nicotine is legal, and it's very available and it, it is affordable. Then the next one, you go to cut because it's just so 
quasi illegal. It is not even classified whether it's legal or illegal. Then when you go to the other one that you must do uh, in, in, in the back street where you are hiding yourself, and the ones that attract a very high uh, penalty in terms of uh, legal consequences, then uh, the, that kind of addiction is low. So, um, and the other addictions are emerging addictions because uh, the, the internet has not been with us for a very long time. So they are just mm -hmm. imagining addiction. We do see them. We do sex addiction. We do see sex addiction. We do see internet pornography addiction. And we also see uh, addiction to certain types of food. And I can even um, say that uh, obesity is a kind of addiction to food. Okay, that's interesting. So the more common, the more legal, the more accessible it is. And that's what you pointed out earlier on. The environmental factors play a huge role in, uh, in how somebody gets addicted to something. Um, so there's questions regarding, um, thank you very much. This is a very educative uh, information, Dr. I wish to understand how to handle a staff who is uncooperative and not willing to go for a uh, psycho-supportive detox, de detox. Yes. One of the listeners yes. has asked you that question. Mm -hmm. There is, a, um, there is a, uh, an, um, an alcohol and drug abuse policy in the hospital. And it clearly stipulates what is supposed to, uh, to happen. When somebody is resistant to treatment, then uh, it explains very well what needs to be done. This person needs to be reported to the senior. The senior is supposed to talk to him. If he's still resistant, then he's supposed to be taken to the, the higher level of management. And the, high, and the highest level of management is the human resource because they are the ones to deal with the discipline mission. And I wish uh, that uh, that, uh, that uh, prisoner does not, has he ever seen the alcohol and drug abuse policy? I mean, um, I yes, Dr. Dr. most of our viewers are not necessarily KNH uh, employees. So they are I employees think, uh, of some, yeah. I'm saying most, most of, uh, I'm saying we have a dynamic uh, audience, uh, not okay. all are specified from KNH. It's a forum for every Kenyan healthcare worker. Uh, so I think uh, the person is basically just asking, or uh, without, let's just assume there's no policy. Uh, what we do here in KNH is we give to the supervisors and the supervisors will now take it up to the employee assistance program at HR. Uh, so the question is, uh, I think the person has also expounded on the question. They're asking if this person is refusing to go to a hospital and seek for help in the event that that person is refusing to actually seek out help, are they in a position to force this person? Hello. Yes, Dr. Ari, did yes, you understand? I've gotten, I've gotten your question now clearly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is not a question that is uh, specific to that, uh, to, to hospital. People will come to us and tell us that uh, they have an addict at home and this addict has refused to go to hospital. Of course, it is very normal for a person who is addicted not to feel sick. Because people go to hospital when they feel sick. This person, in the, in, the, in the normal definition of sickness and the way he knows sickness, he is not sick. In fact, even a person with schizophrenia is not sick in his own perception. A person with the, uh, most mental disorders does not consider himself sick because the symptoms of sickness which we know, like fever, diarrhea, vomiting, pain, swelling, they are not there. In fact, a person who is suffering from a, a manic episode is feeling at the top of, it, of the world. 
Then if you are telling him to go to hospital, he's sick, you know, wonder what we are talking about. This person who is addicted knows that whatever he whatever he needs is his number two. And number two is not found in the hospital. So if it if he takes his uh, substance, he gets well. So he he, he cannot figure out how the hospital is coming in because he missed if he's an alcoholic he wants alcohol to fix this alcohol withdrawal syndrome once he fixes his alcohol withdrawal syndrome is okay in what, where does those two come in in that uh, uh, hierarchy of uh, uh, things he doesn't come in in his own perception but you know the relatives know that there's a big problem or the employer will know that there's a big problem. If we are talking about relatives, the relatives are supposed to start thinking for this person because once you become an addict and once you are assisting treatment, you have ceded your, uh, your rights as an independent thinker. This right can be taken over by other people. So what we are advising the people is to, uh, with such kind of relatives, is to take them to hospital, possibly using whatever possible means they, they can marshal. And if it's an employee who is refusing to, to go to the um, employee assistance program, there are some uh, measures that can be taken as by the policy. And I believe most hospitals have uh, this policy and most employ employers have this policy. It's a requirement by them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's somebody who mentioned something about in the earlier slide, there was a term addiction career. Is this the yes. same as addiction behavior? Please clarify. Yes, yes, it is. They're the same thing. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, on another forum, another person is asking for somebody who's masturbating. Do we say he can't be an addict? And uh, how can we help him if he is? Um, in the first slide, I, I, I took the, in the first, in the first slide, uh, in the first slide, I talked about what can you get addicted to? And I said, you can get addicted to almost anything. Anything. But almost anything. There was, a, there was actually, I don't know if you've ever come across uh, the TikTok video that uh, there was somebody who was addicted to breathing. And uh, I found it extremely strange, but the poor child was actually breathing in more times than the average person, like five times, 10 times more. And I was like, truly, we can actually get addicted to anything. So, yeah. In, on that note, Daktari, what is the most strangest addiction you've ever come across in Kenya? The strangest addiction. Pardon? The strangest addiction. Yes, you've come across on your personal, on your, on your own practice. You see, addiction must interfere. Yes, yes, yes. Addiction must mm -hmm. interfere with your mm -hmm. with activities that are critical for your survival. Mm -hmm. A person who must be a, a teenager who must masturbates occasionally does not qualify mm -hmm. to be an addict. Yes. A person who has got some uh, peer behaviors, but those peer behaviors are not are not interfering with his work. They are not interfering with his day-to-day uh, -day living. That person is not an addict. We must be very clear about who an addict is. And on that note, I can tell you that the the the, the you, you said the the strangest addiction. Yes. Breathing. Uh, breathing. Breathing. Yes, the strangest. Uh, yeah. What the strangest uh, addiction? Uh, that breathing, uh, there's no addiction in that breathing. That fellow, <laughs> that child has got an, uh, that child has got an, uh, 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 a brain disorder. A brain disorder? 
So I think you must disrupt your 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 survival, your your daily income or something. You see, in this breathing thing, in this hyperventilation thing, this person, you see, breathing is an automatic. It's an autonomic or an automatic thing. You cannot consciously breathe three times than the normal person because you are going to get into trouble. You are going to get severe acidosis. And that is not consistent with your survival. But that is a brain disorder. The strictest addiction, I would say, have come across in my many years of practice, would be. Um, sex addiction. Could be. Sorry, I missed that. Sex addiction. Clinically speaking. But Sorry, yes, I'm saying mm. strangest addiction would be sex addiction. And sex addiction will include even masturbation. Okay, okay. So, um, another question, Dr. is, um, uh, okay, personally, I'd like to expand, uh, for you to expand more on the rehabilitation centers. Uh, apart from, uh, is Madare actually considered as a rehabilitation centers? How many do we have as public, which is actually pocket friendly for people to be able to go because uh, we all know mental illness is, is more or less like a chronic illness that yeah. can be very, very, um, very expensive. Over to you. Hello. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, mini- there are, there are very many rehabilitation centers in the country. Madale has a rehabilitation center in the, in, 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 in the actual definition of what a rehabilitation center is. And all, 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 all county hospitals are supposed to have a rehabilitation center. Um, rehabilitation centers are also owned by private individuals. And uh, the problem that uh, w- w- would be is that uh, most, n- or not all the habitation centers, the, 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 the philosophy of, of all the habitation centers are not the same. So, <coughs> oh, excuse me, if you go to the habitation center A, the things they are doing are different from the rehabilitation center B. So the problem we are facing is the, is, is the lack of standardization of the procedure for uh, psychosocial detoxification in rehabilitation centers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, how do you determine the type of happiness that the person is missing? One of the questions from the forum. Okay. <laughs> um, the type of happiness. Yeah. This, because. Uh, uh, yes, because. You mentioned in summary, addiction equals happiness deficiency disorder. So this person syndrome. is asking. Yeah. So uh, yeah, syndrome. Sorry. Okay. Okay, they just asking how do you let me respond. Happiness, there are no types of happiness. That is the first thing that we must understand. Happiness is, is happiness. The only thing that uh, I can talk about in that context is how happy are you? Because there are people who other people might see as happy, but they are not happy. So it Happiness is a, is, is a kind of a, a thing you feel within yourself. And this one can lead from, uh, uh, it is very subjective. You can be happy 
happy yeah? or very happy or happy. Or you can even be sad. Most people will be using substances because they want to get out of their feeling low, sadness. And when they uh, feel happy, and that is what, uh, why we talk about tolerance when you're talking about addiction. So that uh, the, the level of happiness, uh, if I might use the uh, aqua as an example, you, you, when you start in your addiction career, you, you are taking four, four bottles of aqua and you are really happy. Then uh, in the following year, you find that uh, four bottles of alcohol are just like uh, soda. So you increase them to eat. And you continue until the, the, the time you, you can't get that happiness. So it's a kind of a, a very subjective feeling. There are no types of happiness. It's only the, the person who is bearing the unhappiness that knows the level, the level of, the, of his happiness. Okay. Uh, so, and uh, maybe, uh, okay, another question. Is there a way we can do uh, the PD without the patient re re reaching a rehabilitation center in, let's say, the community level or the family level? Can we actually have the psychosocial detoxification? Over to you, Dr. Community, community uh, psychosocial detoxification is possible, but other conditions similar to residential uh, rehabilitation state. In mm -hmm. other words, if you, uh, you choose to have your person not in a rehabilitation center, then you have, must have a facility that number one ensures that the person is not accessing the substances you are trying to, to treat the addiction of. So you must be having a room somewhere in your house where the person is at a lock and key. Because if you release the person and he's a little addict, he'll go and look for number two. So uh, for sake of, Social detoxification, the person must not be roaming in the street because in the street he'll use the substance. And then you are not going to be doing anything. I'll give an example of uh, disafilum. Disafilum is a drug that is used to treat the uh, alcohol addiction. But when you are prescribing disafilum, you are supposed to educate the person on the side effects of diastaphylum, consumes diastaphylum, and alcohol. You are educating this person, and the brain, and you are using the brain to educate this person. And this brain, why diastaphylum has killed them uh, particularly, is because. And the brain goes to the disafilum, and the brain is to continue taking up. Disafilum is a very good drug uh, in terms of behavioral um, uh, conditioning, but because the information is to the addict, uh, addicted person, and the addicted person wants to be, to be happy, and disafilum is doing the exact opposite, then the, the person chooses not to use disafilum. So the person is, if the person is in the community, he must, the conditions the community must mirror those in the rehabilitation center as much as possible in terms of accessibility of the substance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, just a few of the comments. Uh, People are appreciating your very uh, elaborate uh, discussion and they've learned a lot about addiction today, especially the fact that it's genetical. Another question is, can someone be addicted to antihypertensive drugs such that without using it, you feel discomfortable? Can you be, a, I, really? Okay, uh, that would be an interesting question to hear, answer to hear from you, Dr. Ari. 
is there you could could okay i don't know if you've understood the question i can repeat have you repeat can repeat someone be addicted can someone be addicted to antihypertensive drugs such that without using it you feel discomfortable okay i don't mm. I've understood the question. Okay. Can someone be addicted to antihypertensive drugs? The question is, can someone be addicted to antihypertensive drugs? Mm. The mechanism but of know, action. My my understanding is the discomfortability is probably coming up because of high blood pressure. So I don't know. Um let us first of all understand what addiction is. You see, mm. the mechanism of action of uh, uh, um, addiction, uh, I mean, the, the physiology of addiction is very different from the physiology of antihypertensive medication. Because antihypertensive medications, most, most I, I, I know the, 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 the person is asking about the peripherally acting uh, antihypertensive medication. Those medications do not uh, act in the brain, unless the person is talking about the uh, centrally acting antihypertensive. I'm, I'm not sure about what kind of drugs he's talking about, but I suspect they are uh, peripherally act, acting antihypertensive. Peripherally act, acting antihypertensive do not close the blood brain back, so uh, there is no brain issue. The addiction is a brain issue. Our addiction occurs at the level of the brain. So, the, what the, the, the questioner is referring to is the, the, the withdrawal effect, uh, not the withdrawal effect, but the, the, the uncomfortable feeling that you might feel when uh, your, uh, your heart is pounding, when uh, you're, uh, you have high blood pressure. And also, the person might be feeling guilty for not taking the medicine. You know, you can get addicted. Addiction is not just to the, if I give an example of nicotine, addiction is not just to the nicotine per se. It is also to the behavioral repertoire of smoking. Like if you, if you exhale smoke, that gives you some euphoria effect. The nicotine will give you euphoria effect. The lighting of the cigarette will give you its uh, part of the euphorian, euphorian effect. So this person is referring to the behavior, the, 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 the fact that he's guilty for not taking medicine and that can cause him trouble. So once he takes medicine, he feels relieved. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ari. Uh, then one of the audience is actually keen on uh, children. Um, how do you, how do children cope when they see people who are addicted? How, how, okay, I'm not quite understanding, but let me just read word by word. How do children cope with the happiness deficiency syndrome who are born with addiction gene since we see both the real and fake addicts when they grow up? Does it have an effect for them to actually be inclined to? And uh, Dr. Ari, have you understood the question? Yes, I have. Okay. So it is it is natural for for people with the high genetic loading of, of of addiction to engage in that addictive behavior. So the children from that family will learn from, from their parents because you see, these are their parents. They cannot be doing something wrong. So uh, there is something called modeling. So the children will grow knowing that uh, if it is alcohol, alcohol is good. When, uh, when, uh, when daddy comes, when he's drunk, he's very happy. He does not make noise. So they model along that line. And uh, for most people who, are, who, who use those substances, they try to have the substance given in the house. 
they have birth in the house. I've seen some uh, mothers who who have raised their children uh, uh, you, uh, by, uh, through selling Changa. And the children, um, uh, if, if the mother has, has got a high genetic loading of alcoholism, the children obviously become alcoholic <laughs> because the environment is conducive and the genes are ready to be activated. So how do children deal with happiness deficiency syndrome? Children, we cannot say that children can have happiness deficiency syndrome. Children, children, children per se, because uh, they are being molded, they are being raised. They have no independent mind. They are under the, the, the care of their, or, or, of their parents. Remember, when you talk about happiness deficiency syndrome, you are talking about a person who is an independent person who has who, who is able to uh, choose what to do and what what not not to do. For for children, they are not in that. They are in a class where uh, they are still under the stewardship of their parents and. Uh, so it is hard to talk about that in the context of children. In the context of children, you never talk about the conduct disorder. Thank you. Thank you very much. I believe this is the end of our session. Uh, for the listeners, today we're going to also have another session on mental health. Uh, Imagine Adults Mental Health Concerns at 7 p.m. Uh, tomorrow, there will be a talk, also a webinar at 9 to 10 a.m. on vigorous trauma among the mental health professionals. And in the afternoon, we'll have a topic on International Menstrual Hygiene Day. Uh, as a parting shot, thank you very much, Dr. Tari. Mental health is uh, one of the most, uh, a lot of people are, recognizing that it's a big thing and it's something that requires a lot of attention from all stakeholders uh, and thank you very much for being one of the champions for mental health awareness um, as on another side note uh, we are celebrating the international nurses week to all the nurses who are listening or all the listeners please do not forget to say a thank you to the nurses they do an amazing job Apart from their day-to-day -day lives, uh, to their, their day-to-day -day activities at work, they also almost always put a smile on the patient's face and uh, give them hope and uh, words of encouragement. Thank you very much for your exemplary work and uh, keep it up. Dr. Ari, thank you very much for uh, making this presentation today. Dr. Mareko, would you want to have the last word? So I think Dr. Ari has left. Uh, thank you, it's over from me. Have a good day, bye-bye.